Hello, everybody. My name is James. Welcome to another Planet FPL Clash of the Correspondents, where Game Week 19 is not quite finished yet, particularly for all three of us, actually, whose teams are all playing this evening. Uh, but we are going to be looking forward to an encounter in Game Week 20. And both have some very interesting fixtures coming up. Let me first introduce you to our West Ham United correspondent, Chris Stone. How are you, Chris? Yep, I'm good, James. Thanks for you. Man. And our Brighton and Hove Albion correspondent, Sam Murray's in. How are you, Sam? I'm very good. Thank you, James. Hello, everyone. Hope all is well. Looking forward to this one. Sam, I should, do you know what? When you come on, I should let you do the intros, mate. You're doing better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hope you were. Hope you had a good Christmas. All that jazz. Uh, Chris, five wins and a draw in the last seven. Yeah, it feels like all oh, anybody can remember is the 5 0 defeat at Fulham. Where, uh, yeah. where are West Ham at at the moment? <laughs> It's, it's it's a weird one because it's a when you look at the league you think, how how are we doing so well because obviously yeah like you say we've had five wins out of that had that bad bad game v Fulham but there are there are sort of times where you think where's it where's the win coming from but I think it's I think it's just that trio that that trio of um, all hitting form at the right time together linking in well together the Kedza, um Bowen and, and Kudos, and that's the difference when we're, you know, when we're, we're playing. We're not dominating. We're not, you know, we're not suddenly world beaters, but we're winning games. And um, you know, in some cases we're winning by, you know, a, a couple of goals here or there. So yeah, I mean, results wise, um, and I would say performance, but there's there's pockets of it. The performance from the key players is making it kind of exciting in its own way. But yeah, I mean, can't can't complain at all, really. I know we lost to Liverpool um, in the in the cup, which is disappointing. Yeah, that as well. So too heavy away defeat, sure. Yeah, but yeah, I'm you know I'm really really pleased with how we how you know the results we're getting. Um, Man U one was a good one, I think. Um, I know we were at home, but that was a good that was a good result. It takes a bit of pressure maybe off um, these two games, not completely, but a little bit. Well, Sidge always says you're shit with the ball, right? So I presume playing yes. Arsenal and Brighton, two of the most dominant possession teams in the league, should suit you, right? <laughs> we get we get less possession against anybody. <laughs> if we do get, you know, there's not many teams we're going to get more possession. Now, there's there's the odd few, but it doesn't do us any favours like Sidge says. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's always difficult because we know we're going to concede a goal, um, but. We're, cap we're capable. If we're, it's, it's a bit like every game is almost like a cup game <laughs> in the sense of it's, I don't know, it's, you can go into it, you can, lose, you can lose a goal here or there, but then we're quite capable of scoring two goals against most teams. How good is Kudos? Um, he's adapted really well, um, much better than I thought he would. He's an unusual player and I think that's what is, is, is quite hard to play against. He's seen... He, he seems like he's clumsy, but it's it's almost like his way of start, like playing. He's kind of low centre of gravity, where he almost looks like he's kind of stumbling and going to fall over. But then before you know it, he's gone past two players. But his work rate is good as well. Um, and I think he's, he's, what, what surprised me, and I think this is why he's playing so much, is where he's adapted so well. Or he seems to, I wouldn't say adapt, even adapted, because he hasn't had much time to adapt, really, not in the... The, the way Moyes likes to integrate players. But he's coming from a, an outside league and the physicality side of it, he's really, you know, that's where he, he gets stuck in as well. He's not just, uh, you know, kind of just up, up went into the pitch. I mean, he's a bit of a liability sometimes when he does come back and help, but he, he does put the work in. He's a very, very good player. He's a good team player and he's, uh, you know, you couldn't really say anything negative about him, really. We, we seem to have this thing with him week on week, when he joins you, where's he going to play? Where's he going to play? And the conclusion seems to be, well, he doesn't play off the right much, but that seems to be where he's going to be now. He's obviously got this, this position where he, he transfers with Jared Bowen quite a bit and he'll go through the middle for yeah. five minutes and he'll swap over. But generally speaking, he's, he's playing on the right. That's going to be his position going forward now, isn't it? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, Bowen's going to predominantly be more central, but then he, but he will drift. He will. They will kind of interchange a little bit. And ironically, I think the last five goals we've scored in the league, they've all come from that right hand side. They've, at the time, they've all they they've been on the right when they've um, when they've scored. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, he's he's good there. He links up quite well with with Seafell as well. They seem to have quite a good understanding. He's built up a bit of a understanding with Paqueta. 
Um, but yeah, they, he, he just seems to be integrating in 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 every every way to the t- way to the team. He's a very very good player. Doesn't tend to set up as much um, as maybe other other players would. Um, but to be fair, Bowen's not really set up that many many goals himself. Um, but you know, we've got those two. Those having those two is a major difference because it's not you're not reliant on one player. It's much harder now you for a team yeah. to play against when you've got two players who can do totally different things. It's obviously going to be a miss going to AFCON. We'll come on to in a, in a bit solutions that you might come up with while he goes. Uh, but I want to bring Sam in because I was looking at your your results before we started and I, and I found this one absolutely mad statistic that feels almost unbelievable. You've won two league games since game week six, averaging a point per game over the 12 games. That It doesn't feel like that, Sam. What's what's gone on? Is this just Europa Thursday Sunday hangover problems? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it's not a great run of form in the league, is it? Um, it's been it's been a weird season. Um, it's been tough, definitely, and, and it's strange because you 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 said that stat, but I'm still sitting here very happy, really, with everything considered. We lost some important players in the summer, lots of injuries, lots of games, and and the Europa as well. Like, and we're still clinging on to that that top eight. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the Europa. I think we'll blame the amount of games we're playing. Uh, but we're still, still acting, finding a way to compete. Sam, just to cut in, you're acting like a top team now, making excuses, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah like Klopp. <laughs> <laughs> it was dirty. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy. More games is fine with me. But for the players, it's taken its time, I think. Um, yeah, but we're winning our Europa group and we're still, we're still in that top half. So it's, it's not too bad. When we last spoke to you, we said to you, would you take winning in Ajax if it meant not beating Sheffield United? And obviously mm. there's nothing to say you couldn't have both, but that is what happened. Yeah. Does that kind yeah. of sum it up a little bit? Yeah, it definitely seems like there's some, uh, there's a bit of a trade-off for the games on the weekend and everyone, we have prioritised the, the Europa. Um, and yeah, for good reason, the Europa League was the most amazing experience. Just to cap it off at, at the Amex against Marseille with that, that last minute winner. Um, yeah, I think, a lot of people would sacrifice a few games to win to win the Europa League group, but that, that's still what's happened. Yeah, we've had we've had a crazy amount of games, um, and yeah, we've had to balance things out a little bit, uh, and it's a bit weighted towards the the Europa side, which is which is fine. You must be delighted to have won that group after losing the first game. It's some achievement, mate, because you had a tough group as well. Congrats! Does it feel, although it's obviously a really enjoyable journey? Does it feel like a relief that you can put it to bed for a couple of months as well now, though? Yeah, yeah, that, that's... Well, the, the first game, we, we felt like we were just a bit bit out of place, I think. And then at half-time at Marseille, we were 2-0 down thinking, we're, just, this isn't, we're not ready for this at all. And then to win four in a row, not concede a goal, um, really, really good achievement. Um, yeah, it's, it, it felt like that, that win against Marseille was, was, was big to have a little bit of a break and skip that. That extra round because it's uh it's needed and we've got a lot of players coming back around February time so to have that the next round in March hopefully we'll be uh back to a, a full strength team or close to it so yeah it's nice to have a bit of a break and actually have a have some midweeks off and um spread spread the games out a little bit what, more. What's the first date of that? Is that the first midweek in March? Must be the last sixteen, I think. I, I think it's the seventh yeah. of March. Around it is. Place. It's in between twenty-seven and twenty-eight, isn't it? So you've now got eight league games, both of you, before you play again. So obviously, Chris, you won your group as well, and you've obviously had a few years of experience in Europa now. That's massive to skip that that extra round, isn't it? Yeah, it does make a massive difference. It gives you a bit of um, a recovery time, almost a bit of a breather um, in that February month. So that, that does it. It does help as well because then you, you avoid the Champions League teams that are coming that are coming out. Um, potentially, you could get a good one. The thing with the Champions League teams is they're not depending on who they are. The, the bigger they are, the actual easier they are because they enter, they don't tend to end, take it so seriously. So that helps. But it, it, that break is winning the group is a is a big. Big thing. I think it's a big achievement that Brighton that Brighton did there. They did well. So you're both through to the last sixteen. Am I right in saying you're guaranteed a second leg at home as well? So you play one of the teams that wins in this last thirty two playoff round, right? Yes. I yeah. think so, yeah. So you can't draw each other in the last sixteen. How would um a quarter final in the Europa League against Brighton feel to you, Chris? 
I'd hate, I'd hate playing another Premier League team because it's, it's the worst way to go out, isn't it? It's and that's it is a bit, yeah. It's, 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 it shouldn't make a difference, but it just, it just does. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it would, it would be interesting. I, I find, I think it'd be harder. And that sense, really, really daft. I think it, I think it would be, it would be harder than playing, say, one of the European sides, um, ironically. Especially oh. over two legs, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I honestly wouldn't fancy playing Brighton over two legs. I don't want to speak for Sam, but I reckon Sam's going to say, "No, nah, I don't want to play West Ham over two legs." <laughs> That'd be right, Sam. Yeah, well, it would be. It, it would be nice for my bank account. I think it wouldn't hurt as much um, <laughs> going to going to London, but yeah, I wouldn't 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 want that. No, you don't go into European competition to play teams from your own country. And you're right, Chris. It is a sickener to feel like you'd go out to one of your own, if you will, over two legs. It's interesting, Sam, you, you say you obviously wouldn't want to play West Ham over two legs, and that would be something that obviously couldn't happen until April. But until the game early this season, you had this incredible record against West Ham and then had this bizarre game, was it game week four at Yamex, where basically you completely dominated the whole game and yet ended up conceding a stupid amount of XG to West Ham, I think finished higher despite having about 20 less shots than you. Mm. Is this the uh, the kind of epitome of a oh no game for yeah. Brighton next week at West Ham? Yeah, it was uh, a while ago that game, wasn't it? But it was a very strange game because we seem to have all the ball and seem to, but it's like West Ham completely deserved to win because they created so much and the same thing kept on happening over and over again. Um, yes, it feels like, it feels like a, a difficult game every time. But it depends because it's, it's those kind of uh, strikers we play against when it was against Antonio and stuff like that. They're, they're the kind of players we, we struggle against. So we'll see how different it will be. Um, maybe a slightly different approach with like someone like Bowen up front. But yeah, it's still a game we're a bit worried about. So an interesting question for you. Obviously playing my team tonight. We are recording on Thursday morning. Would you rather be playing Tottenham twice over the next two games or West Ham twice? Oh, um... I don't know. Maybe hmm. I would probably prefer with the injuries as well at Tottenham. I think Tottenham would be a more fun game, wouldn't it? Play you twice. I suspect it would be more fun. Yeah, <laughs> probably <laughs> right about that one. I've been saying a few times for, for a while to people, don't miss Brighton versus Tottenham on the 28th of December, but we probably need to slice the on, Sam. It's going to feel like two Carabao Cup teams tonight, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... It's, it's it's rough, you know. Another two injuries as well in in midweek. I'm, it's yeah. I don't know. Don't know what we're gonna do. Don't know what deserve we've got planned. <clears throat> but yeah, hopefully after these couple of games, we have a little bit of a break. So hopefully get some players back. Chris, would you rather play Arsenal twice or Brighton twice? I think because of Brighton's injuries, I'd say Brighton. Um, I wouldn't think that. You think? It's very noble of you, Chris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't want to play Arsenal twice. Yeah, I think it's more. It's more kind of default rather than anything detrimental against Brighton. And I think it's similar to what Tottenham have got. Obviously, Brighton have got a few injuries, so it gives you a few more opportunities. It would be a good. It would be a better time to play them now than later on in the season, as it were. Yeah, tonight's game. I take it anything you get, particularly with those two recent away results: Fulham in the league and Liverpool in the cup. It's probably a little bit of fear of a, a slapping. But at the same time, you're probably as well equipped as anybody as seen in the victory at Tottenham to go there, frustrate and walk away with a result, right? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those anything can happen sort of games. Um, and with West Ham, anything can happen anyway. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not, expecting, I'm not expecting anything. I think having that Man United um, win, if as long as you don't get slapped stupidly, you know, you come away losing 2-1 or even 3-1, you know, that's kind of put that to bed and, and move on and it'll, it'll be that. As long as we play OK, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be happy, whatever whatever happens. What's the solution tonight in the immediate, Sam? With no Mitoma, Adingra, Insisu, Insisu, Fatty, who have I missed? Who else can um, play wide that I've missed? March, did you say March? Oh, sorry, March. Yeah, yeah, a while, yeah. I think even Sully March, you've still got no prognosis on how long he's going to be out, but we think maybe the season, right? It's going to be a long time, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've got a bit of an issue out wide for sure. We were going to lose a Dinger in Matoma anyway to the Asia and um, AFCON, but 
having them both out. And yeah, I think the most obvious solution would be Pedro on the left, Buonanotte on the right. But that's not, I wouldn't put, play them there in our best 11. They're both better centrally, I think. Um, you've got Welbeck who can play out wide as well and Gross who can play everywhere. So him right midfield wouldn't be crazy. And also maybe um, a switch to a back three as well. But this, this, whatever happens, it's not ideal. We might see a few, uh, few academy players in there as well. And it's a difficult one because we've got, we do have such great depth out wide when, when they're all fit and firing. There's, there's a lot of quality players. You'd, you'd have to have a Dinger and, and Cisse on the bench or something like that. So it's not something that is an obvious area in January that you're gonna, you're gonna attack and get some wingers in because come February you've got five of them back and uh, it's all looking good again. I think it's just a case of trying to trying to get through this period um, with, yeah, hopefully Pedro and Buonanotte has got to step up and uh, do a shift on the right. We'll, we'll see how it goes. It's interesting because one of the reasons for doing this podcast now specifically is how do you look, what are Brighton going to do with AFCON and the Asia Cup coming up? Now the players, is a Dinkra ruled out of AFCON as well? Um, I think so, yeah. It kind of said about February time, maybe. So, And I, and I presume Matoma's not going to go and play for Japan now, or do we not know at this stage? Um, I think I think the same with Matoba, but we kind of said four, five, six weeks. It feels like it's going to be yeah, more than a month, which is it's really it's really sad for them as well, because Dinger, especially, he's had such a good season, and I feel like he's been running to the ground a little bit. And when it's something like a hamstring injury, I just think if he'd been, you know, just manage those minutes a little bit better but we're in a position where it was quite difficult to do that so yeah it's pretty uh pretty gutting for him not long before AFCON but doesn't look like he's going to be able to to play much of a part in that what what obviously does make it interesting is part of the conversation was going to be right what's going to happen then in game week 21 but presumably now I don't suppose with the fixtures in game week 20 no one's going to go steaming into Brighton assets this week but from game week 21, it's certainly on. And now we're going to get two games of information to see what De mm. potentially tries. You mentioned, obviously, João Pedro playing wide on the left, possibly. I agree. That seems like the most normal and common solution, although I'm sure he won't play every game in that position. But for people who are on, and some still will be, does that become a hold at the moment then? Or does that really devalue his potential for attacking returns playing now? Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Because I mean, his minutes are going to go shooting up now, you'd think. We don't really have much choice. Um, and he can play as a nine, he can play behind the striker and on the left. I'm sure he could play on the right as well. So he's going to play a lot of games. Uh, he, yeah, not quite as effective on the left from what we've seen so far. He's only played one or two games there. I think he had one in the Europa League, but he wasn't quite as good, wasn't as involved. But I, I think it's a hold. I think he becomes one of the standouts now, to be honest. I know people have been burnt by Pedro before, uh, earlier on in the season, but yeah, he, he's the one now that's, he's got, he's got to play, he's got to keep playing now. It's not that far up to your Solanke's and your Alvarez's though, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, who do you, who do you drop out of those sort of players and probably, probably, if, if you've got him, if, you've, if you're holding, then yeah, it's probably a case of just, just keep him and hope he, uh, hope he gets some returns because he's going to get minutes. Buonanotti feels like a real interesting one, particularly if we get to 21, there's a scenario where people need to find all the money to get to, say, Haaland. So you could make a move like Salah to Buonanotti and Gel Pedro to Haaland, for example. How good is he? He's 4.7. That feels interesting. It feels like there's going to be a lot mm. of minutes over this period. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a weird situation with Buonanotti because I don't think he would have got too many minutes this season, maybe even got a loan if it wasn't for... March and CISO getting injured, um, getting injured early on. It, it's weird. It's, it's, it's a weird player because there's it, definitely quality there. It definitely is, and we haven't really seen. There's, there's been moments, but I think it's decision making sometimes. And when he's out on the right, when he's right on the touchline, it doesn't really feel like he's gonna uh, do anything special. Um, he played a little bit more centrally against Crystal Palace, and that's the best I've seen him play for Brighton. By far, I thought he was really, really good. He came on and he looked sharp, he looked lively. But if, if, he, if he keeps playing in central areas, um, that, that's what I would like to see. On the right, I'm not sure. But yeah, he's, like I said, he's going to get minutes. He's going to get. He's probably going to have to play out there, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, well, quite a bit anyway. 
yeah, yeah, for sure. Like we we could look at I said some academy players, and we've got some. Uh, we've got a winger called Mazalu coming. We we agreed to sign him in January. Uh, he's a left-footed right winger, quite a big, quite a big player. But again, he's he's even more raw than some of these other players. Bonanotte is now one with a little bit of experience, at least, even though he's still a kid. So I think he's going to be the one for now, anyway, on that on that right-hand side. Yeah, it's an interesting one for sure. Yeah, these fixtures from game week twenty-one. Wolves at home, Luton away, Palace at home. Then Tottenham away. We're probably at that point getting to the part where your Mitomas and Adingas might be back available, subject to international injuries, etc. Then Sheffield United away, Everton at home, Fulham away, Nottingham Forest at home takes you up to blank game week 29, which I presume probably will be a blank because you're scheduled to play Manchester City and one of you feels bound to make an FA Cup quarterfinal. But that's a brilliant run of fixtures and things like Buenanotti, who you might go right eight for Taka, could be really useful even in game week 26 at, at home to Everton when obviously there's a few teams going to blank and that game will definitely go ahead. It feels like if he scores in the next two, there might be a little bit of a train for him. I realise Garnacho obviously scored twice at a similar price the other day, but I think people were naturally going to want to look at that Brighton run and go, I want some of that, Sam. So, What's your intention? Well, I have I've got Adinger in my squad right now, so I've got to, um, got to get rid of him. And I was looking at Bonanotte, and by default, like this, yeah, he's going to play. So I don't I don't mind that at all. With Garnacho, like you said, we've just just sort of uh, appearing now with a couple of goals. I think I'd I think I'd probably go for Garnacho over Bonanotte. But yeah, it's one of them. If, if Bonanotte does something something special in the next few games, then it's 4.7 million. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad shout at all, is it? It's a pretty good punt. But you probably won't go down. I, prob- I probably won't, no. We've got a bit of a gap, haven't we? And then it's not too many game weeks away before hopefully some of our players start returning. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not a bad it's not a bad shout at all. Um, yeah, I, I think I would favour Garnacho. Chris, any Brighton in your squad at the moment? Uh, not at the moment, no. I mean, I had Matomo early on, um, but didn't really have anyone else. Um, it's, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it, really? I think it's just where, where you have players like Palmer and Gordon come through, that brought through sort of cheapish options. Um, but then with those fixtures, I think they're, they're definitely worth looking at. It's an interesting time, though, isn't it? Because some of the more expensive players with Akon and Asia... They're not budgets aren't going to be a problem, um, so it's 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 an interesting one. Um, so, I mean, um, had a a bad spell, Sam. Is that unfair? Uh, yeah, he, there's, been, there's been a lot of talk um, amongst Brian fans. He's, he's had a bit of a a bit of a downturn in form. Uh, he's still involved, but his actual output isn't where it was and where he wanted it to be. There's a lot of he's played a lot of minutes, and I think a stooping and being out is quite a big factor here. He gets no support from our left back. Um, I think teams are starting to double up a little bit as well, and he can be can drift in and out of games quite a lot. Um, he's, and he's played so many minutes. Only recently he started to get a little bit of rest, so it's been a much tougher job for him this year. He feels like he's been a little bit more on his own um, up there, and he's got this injury now. I think. It's a bit of time for some some rest, and uh, hopefully, if if we get a Stupinian back and uh, Matoma playing at the same time in a, in a couple of months, then yeah, I'm, no doubt he'll be back to his best. But he just feels he felt like he was on on his own a little bit. What's the uh, asking price for Matoma? There isn't one. Okay. No asking okay. price. <laughs> so as you mentioned, it's Stupinian. We think he's back in the squad tonight. Uh, I presume that's going to be a big ask to start, but with a week from the Palace game to this one, I guess it's not improbable. You mentioned the idea of a back three, which I think you've been building more towards within possession anyway, whether that's been a fullback tucking in or the likes of Balaba going in between two centre-backs. Your mm-hmm. build has been a lot more back three recently. If Stupinan left wing back would get people very, very excited, Sam. Or would that more likely be left-sided centre-back in build-up? Well, I think we're a lot, a lot closer now to the, to that 
happening, him him as a wing back or, or a left winger. Um, with Igor in there, I feel like he would take the, the left sided centre back or the, at least the more more deeper position in defence. So w- once we get Estupinian back, yeah, I, I can't wait to see to see him back in the sub. We have seriously missed him. Um, at first, I thought we could get away with it playing Lamptey in March, and, and we did, and we've done a great job at losing them as well. Such a such a difference having an Igor or Milner at left back. Um, but yeah, Estupinian, there's, there's a chance we see him we just put throw him back in and left wing back. Left wing, we've got, we've got no, we haven't really got anything else. Le- left left wing for you isn't left wing, it's left forward. No. It's left forward, well, whoever plays there. It's left forward, yes. basically. Yeah. So you think there's a chance yeah, that it's he not, could end up playing now? Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't write it off. No, it's definitely a, a, a realistic chance. We'll, we'll see We'll see what happens. I'm not sure we want to be, I don't know, I don't know if we, what happened last time, we're going to be throwing him straight back in. Um might not start either of those, or either of these next two. Maybe give him a little bit more of a break, and then uh, we'll see in a, in a few weeks. But yeah, we've we've got three centre backs. We've got Igor who can play as that that more defensive uh, fullback or left sided centre back. So it gives the stupid a chance to to get forward. So I'm interested to see what Deserve does. He's got a lot of options. He's got no options, but there's a lot of things he can do with the with this, this uh, crisis we've got, back three or, you know, you've got a player like Gross who can play everywhere. So I'd be interested to see see how he adapts to this. Yeah, i come back on to that. Chris, um, obviously Jared Bowen's going to be very popular. He is anyway. But I guess for those who don't own and after this week are looking to sell Salah slash Son, Bowen's going to be top of the queue, isn't he? Looking straight into after Brighton and Sheffield United away, Bournemouth at home. I don't think people would... They're going to think twice if they haven't got him, are they? It's, it's no, going I mean, to be people's first port of call, I would, I would imagine. He's the most he's the most versatile, and I think he's less reliant on other players. Um, obviously, Kudos not being there will be an impact um, in in some respects. But yeah, he's he's an automatic choice. He's you know he's he's playing well. He's he can pop up with a goal. He can keep things ticking over pretty well, and he's you know he's performed pretty well FPL wise, hasn't he? He's not been kind of you know out. Top, you know, he's not. He's he may, he's one of the top sort of ten, isn't he? Um, but he's he's consistent, you know, and that's what you that's what you want. He's he's capable of scoring against any team, and he's adding away goals now this season, which is uh, about time. So he's he's he's, le- he's still learning. He's you know he's still learning playing in that in that role. And even if um, he wish, say let's say for example, Kudos isn't there and he shifted back to the right. It's not as if he's not going to score from that position, um, and he's still he was still drifting in in to centre forward position anyway. He's quite fluid. Could he go back on the right with Kudos out though? Is that dependent on sort of Antonio's fitness maybe a little bit? Yeah, I mean it's I think it's more about it's not so much that oh you've got someone coming in at centre forward who's who's going to do equally well I wouldn't even say better because that's just ridiculous but who could do <laughs> who could I don't do get the well. Antonio hate mate I don't get it um, I, don't, I mean it, he does he does a job unfortunately this season he just hasn't he hasn't been performing at, on any level you know he hasn't been scoring he hasn't been doing that work and providing that um, what he was uh, was before I don't hate him um, he can still perform a role um, bearing in mind his age he's not going to He's going to struggle for ninety minutes, um, so you know he's, a, he's probably a sixty-minute player, which is fine, you know, if you use him that way. Um, I think it's more by default of who, what other options we've got um, when Kudos goes. We've, we're not, we're not exactly blessed with players that are are there who can come in, who are, are either performing well or just come back from injury who were performing well. So that's the problem. Where it's kind of, it's the least worst. It's the least worst solution, really. And I don't think there's an obvious one. It probably is bowing to the right and then someone playing centre forward. Yeah, I'm not I'm not certain on that though. I mean, it doesn't help that one of the players who might have come in is Ben Rama, who's also yeah. gonna go. And then you look yeah. further down the squad, Maxwell Corne might have been an option as perhaps a like for like. And presumably, if he's fit, he's also gonna go to AFCON by the looks of it. Pablo Fornells has been used quite a bit recently, isn't he? He's multifunctional, like he could do a job yes. for you out on the right that would allow Bowen to stay through the middle, I guess. Yeah, it's an option. I mean, unfortunately, we're naming all of those players. They've all been linked with moves away in some capacity. Um, 
So you know they're not they're not the they're not they've 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 become squad players. And when you look at our bench, there's not anyone on there thinking, you know, if someone's not playing well, take them off and bring X on because X don't exist. Um, but yeah, he'd probably be he'd probably be the one. I mean, I, I don't know quite what's happening with Fournell because he's I think he's out of, he's out of contract at the end of the season. Um, you know, there was talk of him going in January, but I guess with what's going on, I know they're trying to get another another year out of him, probably just to lock in some value. Um, but if the offer, off, if a good offer come in, they may they may sell him. But at this time, it's a bit difficult with losing three, potentially three players to um, to Afcon. He's four point six, by the way, four nows. But I think we'd probably rather gamble Wananotti. I think under that circumstance, Sam, I'd have said if we were comparing that. Yeah, yeah. If you're gonna have the have the gamble, I, that, in that case, I would go Bananote. Yeah. Yeah. Another yeah, option, I, mean, I guess, Chris, is a, a little bit like what we saw earlier in the season is to shove Ward Prowse a bit more offensively and drop Suchek back, just so you got yeah. a bit more sort of creativity at the at the top end rather than aiming for Suchek from wide deliveries and stuff. I would guess. Yeah, I mean Suchek has been dropping back. He's not been getting as far forwards as much. He tends to get forward more if we're if we're losing and we're chasing the game, um, you know, pushing forward in the last sort of twenty minutes. So it's it's not really, I guess, for Suchek, he's not really being played to his strengths enough. Um, and Alvarez is getting forward more, but yeah, that's those sort of three. It's a bit of a kind of weird situation, really, because um, Alvarez is 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 at times being quite far forward as well now. So there's no there's no kind of Perfect solution on that one, but yeah, or perhaps would be the op- would be a, a possible to push forwards. But then, would you need that because you've got Paqueta pushing forwards anyway, um, providing that creativity? Yes, but Paqueta's providing that creativity really well at the moment with two absolute William runners. Yes. You're going to lose one, right? Yeah, Which presumably it's going to make Bowie's yeah. task more difficult. People go, well, if it's four nails out wide as an example, I'm not worried about him running in behind, for example. You can have way more focus as a defensive team on what Jared Bowen is doing and you take more of a chance. That's why I mentioned the idea of Ward-Prowse moving perhaps further forward. Serge brought Sochek a couple of weeks ago, Chris. He's 4.9. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable as an eight for Taka. That's less of a gamble than, say, Buonanotti. We could get Buonanotti and say, oh, that looks really good over a number of fixtures. So check at least I know is going to play. And your fixture run's not bad either, right? As I said, you walk into Sheffield United in 21, then it's Bournemouth at home. Manchester United away doesn't hold any fear. Arsenal at home, you've already beaten this season in the in the League Cup. And then it's Forest, Brentford, Everton, Burnley before the FA Cup quarterfinals. So over a long, sustained period, that's a really good run for you as well, I personally would have no interest in Ward Prowse. I don't think at six. No. So check up four point nine would be one to maybe monitor and keep in mind. I think he's a good he's a good player to have in because he's cheap. He plays pretty much every game. He plays most of the minutes, and he's going to get he's going to get an opportunity um, potentially. Um, especially we're going to have to do something a little bit different. Maybe it would be. A little bit more reliant on him being pushed forward or, or on set pieces while Kudos is out. So he's a good, he's, he's a decent, he's a de- at that price, he's a decent enough player. You want someone who at least is going to play, um, even if you're not starting him in your, you know, your five midfield or whatever. You Jared Bowen owner, Sam? I don't, no, I don't have Jared Bowen. Yeah. I, well, I had him, had him a few weeks back, and the plan was to get rid of Martinelli and keep Bowen. Then he got that, um, that knock before playing against. At Palace or something like that, and he was uh, had a yellow flag, so he's out, which was a bad decision. Um, I think I'll be looking to bring him That's back in. You. You're a very good FPL manager. Yes, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I think he'll be back back fairly soon. I think he'll probably be using that transfer to bring Harlem back in. Right, it's probably what a lot of people have got planned if they haven't got him. So, missing you, out is he points. likely an incoming for you then with Salah? Have you got Salah and Son? Um, I, I haven't got Son. I've got Salah. Um, so let me get and... this right. Your next two games against Tottenham and West Ham, and you haven't got Sun or <laughs> Bowen. Well, I just rubbed my hands together. <laughs> set, <mate. laughs> set myself up there. Yeah, it's this. It's obvious now. Yeah, we know what's going to happen. So even more painful. <laughs> even more painful. Um, yeah, Bowen probably probably soon. Haven't given it. Haven't looked into it too much. But 
I just reverse my mistake. I take it you've got him, Chris Bowen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I should have I should have stuck to my guns and put him in from the start, but because I knew that I'd want him at some stage. He's one of those players that's quite difficult because there's all there's always another team that's got a better fixture. But he's if I think he's just one of those. If you can, he's if you can afford it, he's better to just leave in there because he's is of his consistency. And when he's it's rare that he's injured. I know he was out for a couple of games, wasn't he? But he played he played the ninety minutes, and that's the other the other factor as well. Last season, at the beginning of last season, he came in, at, I want to say, at 8.5. And it was yeah, a it was massive a cluster of other players that had come in at 8. And he was still, even though he was more expensive, he was still a consideration for me. I didn't go there. One of the things that said at the time was that if he was playing for a so-called Big Six team rather than West Ham, he would have had a bigger price than 8.5 on, on what he'd done that previous season. Now, last year, he didn't really live up to the billing. He scored, he got 29 attacking returns. That, that year in 21-22. Last year, just the 15. He's already on 10 this year. Sorry, tell a lie, 12. He's now performing like a player that should be nearer the 10 million bracket. Really? Yeah, I mean, when you when you think as well, when he, I can't put the breakdown, was it something like, I think uh, in that 20, that, that season you mentioned, he got quite a lot of assists in that, where now he's getting more, more of those a goal. So in FPL terms, that's an extra two points. Um, we probably kept a few more clean sheets as well, so you're kind of losing that a little bit, but that's by the by. Um, I mean, Kudos is an impact on him because Kudos is doing better on bonus, seems to pick up the bonus more. Um, it's probably more likely to get more than one goal, but obviously Kudos isn't going to be there for a while. But yeah, I mean, for his consistency, you can't you can't really knock him, and he's, he's, he's effective. And he, I don't know, he's just one of those sort of players, he seems to be improving and just just the way he talks and you know in interviews i know that's sometimes a little bit kind of lip service but he just seems to be quite grounded and and whatnot um and he's quite he's he's pretty more likely to score later on in the game than he is early, earlier earlier in the game yeah it's interesting will, just looking back up. at some of them numbers so in that season we'd said the the big hauls like over 200 fpl points 17 assists and he got actually got nine assists last year as well. So 26 assists across the last two seasons. He's only on one at the moment. But the difference now, I presume, is where he's playing. There's less on yeah. him to provide. That season, he got over 200 FPL points. He scored 12 times. He scored 11 league goals already this season. For the stats, guys, he is overperforming his XG, by the way, at the moment. But he, I think he's always struck as a player that is very capable of doing that. And he has, Sam, just for your benefit... His consistency is such that actually he's only got one double point return all season. Mm. Any prizes for guessing who that was against? <laughs> was it against us? It was against you, mate. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah, Bowen. Bowen's almost inevitable. When I when I see West Ham have scored, I, I kind of feel like he's going to be involved one way or another. Uh, but yeah, he's kind of play like that chips away. Um, should be interesting. Game week 21, Chris, you go to Sheffield United, who, following defeat to Luton, uh, look like they're really back in, but they're always in trouble, but it's looking particularly bad from now. Game week 21 is going to be interesting for captaincy. Even if Haaland's back, it's Newcastle away. If he's not back, I don't think any of us fancy that from the two teams. Tottenham go to Manchester United without Hyun Ming Sun. Salah's gone. Liverpool have got Bournemouth away. Bowen at Sheffield United... Or are we looking at Arsenal players at home to Palace, maybe, in 21? That statistic I've just given on Bowen's double-point hauls is very off-putting from an FPL captaincy perspective, I think. Yes and no. I mean, it is. it is. I mean, you want your captain to score something. So, on that basis, he's not a bad shout. Eight points is better than three or four points. Um, but like you say, if you're looking for that explosive, you know, a double digit haul is possibly not going to get it. Um, the Arsenal one is it, the Arsenal Palace are a, a tricky side, aren't they? They're, they're, they're very difficult to, to predict against. Where I guess with Sheffield United, you'd think West Ham are going to score the likelihood without Kudos, Bowen's going to be is going to get a goal. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of those, isn't it? Do you take the safety of 
or not safety, but the potential, the less risky, less risky pick, but also less higher ceiling, or go for someone like an Arsenal player who could, you know, someone could, could get double haul there. You, you would um, right fancy Bowen scoring that fixture, though, wouldn't you? You would, yeah, yeah. I, I would probably, at the moment, I mean, just obviously talking it through, I'd look at it more closely, but. Uh, if I was thinking, okay, I just want a little bit of safety just to get some points from my captain rather than than gamble and getting more, then Bowen's not a bad a bad shout. Yeah, this Ariola Flabianski situation, Chris, is it over now? Is that is that it? Is Ariola again now done? Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd say he's back in back in back in the team. Yeah, I think it was just extra precaution around his his injury. Um, an interesting. Obviously, Fabianski's site looks like he's going to sign another contract, but he would be the cup. He would be the cup player rather than the Premier League um, player. It's I mean, if you're in Europe, you can offer a lot more, can't you? If you've got, you can, you can, you know, potentially you could offer him sort of. He could be getting, you know, close to twenty games a season, which you might think at that at his at his age at this level isn't isn't too bad. He might he's probably reconciled with that. It's not a bad. Fuck you, a bad assuming thing. twenty cup games. Who the bloody hell do you think you are, mate? <laughs> 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 well, you've got the. You, I'm just saying, you got all the yeah, groups. Yeah, Europe. I know what you are. Shut <laughs> up, mate. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's going to stay in goal. Me and Sid just got to the point where we were like, do you know what? Maybe Flappy's going to stay in here because you kept a couple of cleans without Ariola, and then suddenly Ariola was back in despite conceding the five at. At Liverpool, interesting one. He got Ariola, Sam. Yeah, yeah, he was on my uh, on my bench last week for his clean sheet. So I've still kept hold of him though. <laughs> you have got now, haven't you, Chris? What's that? I've got. You I've have got, got him Ariola, now, yeah. haven't you? Yeah, I've been playing most of the time, and then I had. I think I brought in Sanchez, and then uh, not Sanchez, um, Petrovic, and then um, yeah, so I had Ariola, had Ariola's points on the bench. Um, Predicting our clean sheet is is probably nigh, nigh on impossible. <laughs> I mean, you've not had many, have you? I mean, he's no, only had no. two, Ariola. I mean, to be fair, you and I mean, I know Man United haven't been performing brilliantly, but it's not it's not one of the teams that you would think, oh yeah, he's you know, he's there for a clean sheet. Um, Wolves would have been impossible, but obviously he wasn't playing. So is that right? You've only kept three clean sheets this yeah. season in the league. Yeah, that's yeah. And, and two, a really two surprising of them been... start. And bearing in mind, two of them have been in the last last few weeks, Wolves and Man United. Before yeah, that, it was sure. only the so one. Maybe the situation's beginning to improve. Mind you, Sam, three feels like a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we were way more than that in the Europa League. <laughs> 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 we won't talk about our Premier League record. Crazy. Zero. That, we're almost in the new year. That is staggering, mate. <laughs> yeah. and is it, is it just the way you play or is there a bigger problem here? <laughs> That's the thing, because... I'd say two of our best players this season have been our two centre backs, Duncan Van Heck. So it's not their fault. They are they are playing really well. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the way we play. We seem to concede silly goals every game, and they're rotating goalkeepers. I think that's what people look at, don't they? So well, yeah. I, I, on the outside, it is easy to look and think, right? You're not keeping clean sheets. Bit of continuity wouldn't go amiss. And he yeah. changes the goalkeeper like every two games or so. Yeah, is that annoying people? Yeah, yeah, I think at this point you get into the point where you've got to, you've got to make a decision. I think and stick with one of them. It doesn't seem like whatever the plan is, it's not seemed to benefit either of them. Um, it's difficult to get a bit of rhythm. I think as a, as a goalkeeper, we're changing it every every two games, or it's just completely random. It seems like at this point, I think that's the most obvious cause, easiest explanation. Yeah, there's a lot that go, there's a lot though. It's, the midfield isn't the level it was last year, and we knew that was going to happen. We knew we'd miss Caicedo and McAllister. That that affects us a lot um, in build up and winning the ball back, um, yeah, and injuries. There's a lot of things we can blame, but zero clean sheets is uh, is very very bad. Is, is is there anything in it in terms of the choice? Like, is there a certain style of playing out of one of the keepers? Because I can't find anything other than what you'd said previously. It felt like they were getting two games each, and then he was changing it, and now it just feels even more random. Yeah, yeah, it feels. I can't really can't really predict who's going to play in goal. Um, sometimes we felt like we had some of the tougher away games. You think it would go for Steele, but then he went for Verbruggen, and yeah, it mixes it up all the time and. 
and neither of them have really um, made a, a like a, a solid, solid case to be number one. It was for Bruggen. He had a he had a few he had a few good games, and then he made that mistake at Palace, and kind of kind of ex- ex- um, expected, isn't it, with the way we play and the way teams are pressing us now a little bit differently. Arsenal were the best example. They pressed us off the pitch. We, the same thing kept on happening. They teams are slightly adapting, um, but we've got to adapt too. So. Yeah, it's, it's whoever plays in goal, it seems it doesn't seem to be too different game to game as in the quality and the way they play. It's just yeah, I think we've got to pick one now and, and stick with it. You mentioned Van Heck. I think he'd have been coming in for some attention. Probably Malo Gusto's probably returns for Chelsea last night has probably put a, a kind of moved that out of people's minds. But he started the last eight in the league. Mm. He is 4.0. Here's what we'll do halfway through a season. Let's buy a defender from a team that hasn't kept a clean sheet yet. <laughs> but that fixture run is great and good enough that he could sit as a fifth defender, yeah. couldn't he? Yeah. Is he likely to stay in the team? Is he automatic first choice now? Or is there a case where Julio's been covering kind of left side, Adam Webster's had injury problems? What's the situation? Yeah, it, it's always it's quite difficult to say automatic automatic um, first choice. He, he is in our best 11 and he's been probably definitely one of our best players this season his improvement's been amazing and deserve he said that a few times now he, he's been really really good um yeah the, the threat is from eagle um and then when once the stupid end comes back you've you've got to shuffle it around a little bit and there'll, there'll be a there'll be a minute's threat there but he is he's our first choice now behind dunk he's our second best center back and He's really made that position because there's a few few centre backs. Beginning of the season, obviously we had Webster as well and Eagle, and it was kind of a free for all. Really, there was there were changing positions every every week, and there wasn't really a standout. Van Heck's a standout centre back now. Yeah, um, I said you've always got the threat from Eagle, but we've got to keep a clean sheet at some point, haven't we? So it can't be that that bad of an option to sit on the bench. At, at yeah, four I'm hoping it's uh, it's not tonight. In those eight starts, he's accumulated like thirteen FPL points. Oh, yeah. It's not, very, it's not anything to write home about, <laughs> is it? But it's certainly it's a true. talent. I, I think he'd, he he might even be one where he comes in at four point five next season or something, Sam. And we we speak about him quite a bit, maybe pre season yeah. if he's really going to establish himself. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I've got a solution to your goalkeeping problems, though, Sam. Just play Pascal Gross there, mate. He's played <laughs> everywhere else, so what, what? Why not? Maybe you start keeping clean sheets if he plays in goal. What a legend, Pascal Gross. Yeah, he is just. I thought I was Pascal Gross's biggest fan, but Deserby loves him even more. He, every game, he just speaks about Pascal Gross. He's he's asked Gross's parents at interview if they've got another Pascal Gross he can have because um, <laughs> he, he he plays everywhere. He's the most consistent. He's you rely on him wherever. He, even in one game, he plays three or four different positions, doesn't he? So yeah, where, and wherever he plays, he seems to be involved. He seems to create chances. Um, I love him. Presumably, with no European football over this period, at least till sort of up to game with 27, presumably he's going to play, whether that's right back, left back, six, eight, ten, seven, yeah. eleven. I mean, he could basically play any of them. Mm-hmm. He's 6.4. He is consistent as, isn't he? he? Yeah. I mean, if I said you got to buy gross for 6.4, Buonanotti at 4.7, where's your, where's your money going? Yeah. Probably it's probably gross, isn't it? It's it's not an it's one of them is it's not an exciting choice. It's not really it's not someone you're gonna be watching the game and getting you know he's gonna go flying past players. But he's in the same sort of category as a a Douglas Luiz or a Bernardo Silva. I don't know in that sort of that sort of bracket, he'll tick over. He's ticked over nicely for six seasons now, is it or something like? He's gonna get returns and he's always involved. And yeah, he's not yeah not exciting, but he he's not a bad option. And looking at what we've got now. Especially in the in the midfield, he's, he's the best one, I reckon. The, the difference with the two players you mentioned, though, is like Bernardo <clears throat> Silva is basically playing right wing for Manchester City mm. as it stands, and obviously that could change. Douglas Luiz is on penalties for Villa. I presume João Pedro will be on them for you at the moment, Sam. Yeah. He's going to get a Hope lot so. of minutes, I would say. With Gross, you can get him, and you know there's every chance like he could easily play right back tonight, couldn't he? Yeah, yeah. He can he can he can play everywhere, which is it's, it's nice for his minutes, but it's not great when you you, you see him at right back. I, I think recently, De Zerbi has done everything he can to not play him at right back. When we make him subs, he, he doesn't want to put him there unless it's unless he has to, unless he really has to. We got Hinchwood now, who is like a a mini Pascal Gross, and he's been playing at right back. Um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we sign a right back in the summer. I'll be the Zerbi's uh, made it clear that yeah, the in, interest into after the uh, Palace game where he kind of started to crack and said, "I need some, I need some players, I need some, need some investment," which is uh, interesting. I remember some similarities to, to Gus Poyet, I think, um, when he turned around to the director's box and rubbed his fingers together with some more money from Bloom. We'll see how this one, how this one goes. We've got to back him in the summer and right back has to be uh, in the in the January, sorry, and right back has to be has to be top of the list just to just to give Gross his, his, his free row in centre mid. But we'll see Gross centre midfield more often than, than right back, I'm pretty sure. And maybe even in attacking midfield. There was a trend as well though, some of the more difficult games historically that Gross would play right back. And we've seen it a little bit recently mm. with Hinchwood as well. Like I don't think he's going to look at oh you're playing Huming Sun tonight. Oh sugar I've I've got to find a, a solution where I play a defender out there. I mean, probably Gross or Hinchwood, one of them probably is going to have to play right back tonight, I'm guessing, looking at it, because yeah. Veltman's injured. And uh, as uh, De Zerbe very much pointed out to Chris Hewton, another one of your former managers, um, he clearly hasn't watched Brighton play because he wants to call him up for Ghana and he's like, Lamptey's injured, this is not <laughs> going. Um, Tarek Lamptey, unfortunately, always seems to be injured. So, mm-hmm. I mean, your fit defenders is Igor, Dunk, Van Heck and his Stupenham now back in the squad. I, I guess if that was a back four, as an example, it would have to be Van Heck up right back, would it? Or, or could he play Igor there, which wouldn't feel natural? No, no. It'll, yeah, I think it would be Hinchwood at right back. We, we Basically, we, we don't really have anything out wide, whereas full back or, or going forward, we just have loads of centre midfielders. Um, Hinchwood seems to be the one that's standing out at right back. We can play Milner there as well. Um, yeah, I think... We try try everything we can just to keep growth centre midfield. Otherwise, things start to fall apart. Gents, pleasure. Thank you both so much. Let's do some predictions before we finish. Uh, Chris, Arsenal away tonight. Um, optimistically, he's going to say we lose two one. <laughs> so I think that, uh, that I'll be okay with that. Seems fair. I don't know if that's optimistic. Optimistic would have been oh, two one away win in London. You've done that on a Thursday night fairly recently, somehow. That probably be deleted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sam, your team v my team tonight. See you at the Amex. Go on in, mate. Prediction. Um Sam's looking very stressed for the benefit I'm of those gonna... in the audio. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just done it. I wouldn't even be able to predict the lineup. I would say two two. I don't know who's gonna score for us because I don't know who we we can play up front, but yeah. Joe Pedro will probably get a few. 2-2. Uh, I, I went 3-0 Arsenal tonight, Chris, in my predictions earlier in the week. I'm going to I'm gonna stick with that. Although I think Suja's right to say, like, if Arsenal score early, yeah, sure. If not, then maybe not. I went 2-2 for us as well, Sam. But I also had the caveat on Sunday's podcast that I said that if Romero was fit, I thought we'd win. And if he wasn't, we'd probably get battered. Hmm. Um, he's obviously out for four to five weeks out as well now. So we've got four fullbacks playing tonight as well. We both got problems, <laughs> but I also didn't know that you wouldn't have any wingers available. Either. So we've got we've what got a a, we've got a team full of fullbacks, and you've got no wingers. <laughs> it's a real shame because it should be a cracker. Actually, um, it, it's almost impossible to predict. Actually, though, yeah. uh, go on. And next Tuesday, Chris Brighton at home. That's such a tough game to. Uh predict um i don't believe it but i'll go for the i'll go for a two-run win i don't believe it but i'll predict it anyway okay sam west ham away wasn't a bogey um, team but maybe might be now yeah i just i'm gonna i'm gonna sit on the fence with this one as well one one two draws one, one. i'll take that uh, I think their aerial bombardment at certain points might be a problem, Sam, is what I'm thinking. If they defend properly, you have, I think it's fair to say, you know I love watching your team play. Definitely the last few times I've watched you, including Palace last week, I did think, yeah, it's going a bit nowhere, some of this. Mm. It's, uh, it's beginning to feel at times possession for possession and teams know yeah. that, that De Zerbi wants you to go and press. So the less teams do it, the more difficult it becomes. And obviously you've been missing some creative players that we've documented Tottenham ain't going to sit back tonight you ain't going to sit back it could easily be that one team wins 4-0 one way or the other and it could Mm. be 3-3 or it ain't going to be 0-0 is it Jason yeah teams are definitely adapting like you said like the the teams that can afford to press us like like Tottenham and Arsenal they'll come at us whereas the teams that are more than happy to sit back will sit back and we struggle against but then as you said 
Arsenal press you really well. Yeah, they done they done they done well yeah. the other week. Um, and my team will come and try and be brave and slash stupid tonight. I might get our <laughs> pants pulled down. Uh, gents, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris. Anything you want to plug before we finish? No, no, I think we're all good. Covered everything. So thank you. And for yourself, Mister Murray. Um. No, oh, well, my Twitter, uh, FPL Seagull. Where you can find X, Sam's accurate 11 out of 11 predictions for <laughs> Brighton and Ups every single week. Sam, if I get 7 out of 11, I feel like I've got an achievement, mate. More than, oh, yeah, 50, more than 50% I'm winning on the predicted lineups. Thank you both so much, gents. Uh, Sid will be back with me for the game week review uh, tomorrow on Friday. Uh, next week's Clash of Correspondence, I can tell you, will be scheduled for next Thursday as well. And it will be high flying Neil Grover's Bournemouth against uh, Dan Lord's Liverpool, who will be Mo Salah less. Just sees me to say thank you very much to Chris and Sam. Good luck, gents. Cue music, please. Manchild. 